ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد all praises all thanks are due to Allah alone therefore we praise him and seek his help and seek his forgiveness we seek refuge in Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequences of our actions the one whom Allah guides, nobody can misguide him. And the one whom Allah leaves to stray, there is no one to guide him. I bear witness that there is no God, no Ilah, worthy of worship except Allah alone without partners. And that Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the final prophet and messenger to the whole of mankind. I apologize for breaking up your, um, your program in this way, but it really is un unfortunate. We have another program in West London. Uh, regarding Ramadan, alhamdulillah, which starts at 4 o'clock and it takes at least an hour to get there, so this is why I'm unable to stay for so long. Um, alhamdulillah, I'm uh, 37 now and I've been a Muslim for four, six, seven, about 13, 14 years, alhamdulillah. Um, when I was 17 years old, I shared a house with some people and uh, I was given a gift, um, a book, I'm being very brief here, inshallah, given a gift, a book, which I had with me for some eight years. I had this book with me for eight years, and uh, after eight years, um, I read a lot of books, and I decided, alhamdulillah, to read this particular book. And upon reading the first page, uh, I decided that what I was reading was the truth, was from God, was from Allah. Now, at that point, I wasn't a very deeply religious person, but I believed that this was the truth and this was from God, this was from Allah and I made an intention that to read it all and as long as there was nothing strange then inshallah I would become a Muslim now brothers asked me, he said this brother is by the way a Muslim and he said to me what is it that happened? because he's, he's asking as a Muslim, he's trying to understand what is it that you as a new Muslim or you went through, what did you experience? how did it feel? so on and so forth, you know and um, I used to say it was like all the lights coming on, you know. But this is not really, this doesn't explain that feeling that you get. So one of the ways that I now use to describe it, it is like finding yourself with a very difficult problem. It could be, for instance, if you're working on your computer and you call a friend who's very knowledgeable about computers and you can't make something work. And then he tells you, and then you, ah, oh, all right, um, Ah, see, yeah, I understand, Akhi. No, 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 I'm okay now, I'm fine. That feeling of relief, that feeling of contentment, basically when you actually get and understand something. It could be for, for brothers who refuse to ask people directions when they're driving, when they're lost, and, you know, eventually do or eventually realise where they're going, and then start, yeah, now I see the signs, I see where I'm going, after the frustration that you felt of being lost and driving around and seeing the same house on the corner that you passed three times ago, and going around and around in a circle, you finally see, on, from your instructions in front of you, ah, now I'm, ah, khalas, and then this one, yeah, no, I know where I am now, I'm going to be with you in, in five minutes or so. That feeling of relief, when you finally found the solution to a puzzle, and this is what really discovering the truth felt like. You just multiply that, of course, by a million or how many other times you want to multiply it by. But that is really what it is. For the first time in your life, you give your soul that which it desires. You know, we drink when we're thirsty, we eat when we're hungry, we sleep when we're tired. But our soul, do we nourish it? We nourish it with battle all the time. And for the first time in your life, you're actually nourishing your soul with that which it desires. The truth, alhamdulillah. So that's, that would be one way of, of describing it. Now when I embraced Islam, um, there was no, no real calling to the Sunnah, no real calling to, to anything really specific. We know there was, uh, at my time, there was no, no Islamic publication houses like Al Hidayah or the, the ones that we know now. I mean, mashallah, there's so many, Al Bashir and Sheikh Bilal's company and these, uh, what's the name of it? Darul Fatah. All of these companies, they weren't around when I embraced Islam. Um, we, you know, we had Bukhari, we had Bukhari and Muslim from uh, from Pakistan, and we had Ahmed Didat's videotapes and tape recordings. 
and we would head down to Hyde Park and we'd knock heads with the Christians and whoever else. That was what we would do, you know, just memorize a few verses. I mean, I was, I was down at Hyde Park like two weeks after I embraced Islam. <laughs> you know, this is how it was, you know. SubhanAllah, you know, you're just down there, man, firing away. And when I went to Hyde Park, SubhanAllah, I met a group of, of, of Christians. And this group of Christians were doing what they were doing and stuff. And amongst them was an, a young Arab girl. And, you know, I had a very rose-tinted, a very, very, uh, how can I say, strange concept of the Middle East. I mean, as I'm sure many people do who are, who are non-Muslim or know nothing about international politics. That is, any Arabs are Muslim. That was it. You know, there's no such thing as Arab Jews or Christians or anything else. And, um, you know, I said, so, you know, you're Muslim. And no, I'm, I'm Finikiin. I'm from Lebanon. I'm a Christian. I was really stunned. And I said, what? You must, you're an Arab. How can you be a Christian? It's impossible. And she was with this group of Christians down Hyde Park doing their, whatever they were doing, arguing with Muslims. So I said, inshallah, you're going to, you know, again, with my ignorance, inshallah, I'm going to make you a Muslim. I mean, you, you know, this is how you speak when you first embrace Islam. You don't know. So I said, inshallah, you know, you're going to become a Muslim and I'm going to give you dawah and stuff. And what I would do is I would go away and... She would ask me certain questions regarding Islam, and I would go away, and I would ask people, alhamdulillah, I at least had enough common sense to go and do that, and I would come back with the answers. And this went on for a period of six weeks. And alhamdulillah, after six weeks, she embraced Islam, and um, I think two, two weeks later, we got married. And, uh, <laughs> well, you know, you know, come on, man, let's be honest. You know, let's be straight, bros. I mean, you know, you have to check your intention when you go to Hyde Park. But, you know, all these single brothers, all these single brothers, it's like the only place you can go to meet a sister, you know. This is what it's all about. This is the reality, you know. Let's be honest. I mean, let's be straight. Sisters are down there, you know, and brothers are down there. And inshallah, it's good. And, but you're down there, inshallah. Of course, fisa bili la, but boy, if you can... You know, if you can get married as well, that's nice too, isn't it? <laughs> and it's quite bad, really, because I've actually not been back since. It's part of I mean, not, not in that sense, anyway. And, mashallah, this is, this is our, our daughter, Maryam, my eldest girl. It's my boy in the end, and now, alhamdulillah, I have five children. So, so alhamdulillah. Now, the thing was, as, as those who are familiar with Hyde Park, how many of you are familiar with Hyde Park here? Anybody familiar with Hyde Park? Sisters familiar as well? Okay, so you know how it goes down there. Hyde Park is like a bit of a feeding frenzy. And it can be, a dad can go, I mean I even heard recently, uh, a few weeks ago, of a brother using expletives. You know, I mean using foul language when talking to a Christian. And Sapana in some way trying to justify that. So I mean it's unbelievable really. I always say that, you know, all the Bilehim and the Shaitan Ajim Shaitan, polishes his shoes and puts his tie on and says, Sunday I'm going to Hyde Park. You know, that's really because it's just so, so much munkar and so much bad goes on down there by way of the manners and adab of Muslims and, of course, Christians and whoever else is down there. But, of course, uh, mashallah, a great deal of good has come and many people have embraced Islam. And I'm, you know, I'm handling testament to that because I'm married to somebody who embraced Islam after being giving dawah there. But... I used to go, we, we lived in um, Cricklewood, which is North, North London, and I used to go on a bus down Edgware Road, which is like one very long road. It's quite funny because Edgware Road, you can go like from the Arab part of Edgware Road, then you can go to the Irish part of Edgware Road, and you know, the black part of Edgware Road, and then the, the ethnic mixed part of Edgware Road, because it's such a long road, right up to the Jewish part of Edgware Road. So the top is the Jewish part, and then down, 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 and the bottom end, not the bottom end, but you know, to the right down Hyde Park and Marble Arch end is the Arab part, subhanAllah. And I would see out of the bus window um, socialists, like socialist workers, who I'm sure you're aware of, and Christians. And they would be standing at their tables and promoting whatever they were doing. And I, alhamdulillah, with a brother, um, Aberdeen Grillo, his bro brother's in, I think he's in Dubai, he's in UAE now. And we said, you know, we sat, we had a meeting together and um, we said, you know, it wouldn't be a good idea if we could get a table of our own and just go out there and, you know, do some dawah and stuff. So, we decided, we made a decision, he went for Umrah, and when he returned, we went and bought some literature and bought some booklets and stuff, and we started to give dawah. And then, uh, alhamdulillah, other brothers heard about this project, and said they needed, you know, assistance in doing it. And we designed a poster 
for the front of the table, which alhamdulillah our Sheikh Abu Amina modified for us because we used to have there's no God but Allah on the front of the post. Remember that one? And uh, Sheikh Abu Amina is one of our, our uh, committee members and shura members. So he corrected it and said there is no God worthy of worship but the one true God Allah. So this is now how we changed the poster. And um, we designed the poster in a way that would, um, would confirm a particular Quranic verse and a hadith. And this Quranic verse and hadith is when Allah says, we drew forth all of the descendants of Adam and took a declaration from them saying, am I not your Lord? They replied, yea, yes, verily. We did this so they would not say in the day of judgment, we were unaware of this. Will you punish us for that which our parents did whilst we were unaware? So this is the idea behind the wording of the poster. And on the other side, we've got the poster here, so I can show you. And on the other side, inshallah, we have... You hold that side, Bilal? Bilal's my brother-in-law, by the way, so... You can roll it, roll it, roll it, all the way out. So this is the poster. Stand up, Billy. Yeah, so this is the poster here. And on the other side, for those sisters as well, we have Prophets of Islam. And the idea again is to show, for instance, Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam. So anybody who believes that we, you know, we're Mohammedans or we only believe in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, this shows and we've got, you know, Prophets of Islam. I hope I've got it the right way around, have I? Yes? Is it upside down? Yeah. No, it's not? Okay, and it's got peace be upon him all at the at the end. So that's the idea of this particular banner, inshallah. And alhamdulillah, what it does is it stops people when they get to you, you know, they already know what you're standing for, they know you're Muslim. So when they arrive at the table, alhamdulillah, they know inshallah you're Muslim. And it stops them arriving there and saying, Oh, what's this about? and then being abusive. Now what we've now introduced also, Junaid, just pass me that one please, inshallah. What we've now introduced for the size of the tables, a brother had this idea and it's a fantastic idea. If you hold that one up, baby, please. We've now introduced this one to the size of the table, which is, let there be no compulsion in religion. This is very famous ayat, 256 of Baqarah. The idea is simply that when people approach the table, at the side, they see this. So this idea of compulsion in religion, before they reach the table, they can read there's no compulsion in religion. That's the first thing they read. And then when they come to the front, they then see the front of the poster. This is a way of diffusing any, any problems. And if they come and say, you know, which is very common, oh, you know, uh, sometimes people come and say, oh, could I do this in Saudi I couldn't do this in Saudi Arabia. You know, I don't know if anyone's uh, ever heard this kind of statement. And you, they need to, of course, be reminded that Saudi Arabia is a theocracy. This is a secular democracy. If it was a Christian state, we couldn't do it either. But it's not. So, you know, it helps to, to diffuse the situation. So the idea is this on the sides and that one on the front, alhamdulillah. And also, we needed to be specific about what our call was. Because in the old days, way back when, people would come to Islam, but what were they coming to? Then there used to be this mad scramble. And those days, alhamdulillah, they're not active now. Alhamdulillah, they've been humiliated. There used to be uh, quite active groups of Shia among some reverts, some reverts who had wanted to do muta and uh, you know, wanted to have girlfriends and so on and so forth, so many of them became Shia, so they wanted to have temporary marriages, but they just were following their desires. And um, these guys were, were active in actually trying to get new people that embraced Islam to become Shia. But alhamdulillah, you know, we needed an organization that was calling to the Sunnah. Now you had GMAS, which is, uh, you know, already were doing their, their, at that time it was like the first conference they had. But we needed something, inshallah, separate to that, like on the streets, inshallah, doing, doing something where we were calling non-Muslims to Qur'an and Sunnah from the word go. This is a very important point, that you're calling them to Qur'an and Sunnah from the word go. And we also wanted an area whereby the adab would be different from Hyde Park. So thereby, you know, we, we, so we decided to do them on a Saturday, do the tables on a Saturday, which is the, like the Eid of the Kuffar. And they're walking around the town centres and stuff and they see, you know, the table and they'll saunter over and they'll have a chat and so on and so forth. I was given a Qur'an, alhamdulillah, I read it, I became a Muslim. And inshallah the idea was hopefully through discussions and leaflet and booklet distribution, people would also do the same thing. That was the idea and alhamdulillah now we've got sort of 12 years later and we have, look, look at, we have now had over a thousand people embrace Islam since we started the project 12 years ago, alhamdulillah. So, you know, now, regarding the dawah tables, what's very important, I need to make this point very much to you brothers and sisters here, is 
People will often come up with this excuse, oh, you know, I don't have any knowledge, I'm not, I don't have any ilm. You just teach what you know, you know, nothing more. Whatever you know, tell them about what you don't know. As our Sheikh Imam Malik, when he was asked a question which he didn't know, so tell him Imam Malik doesn't know. So if you don't know, and you're humble, and you don't like to run around in circles trying to create some strange answer, people have more respect for you. So if you don't know, just tell him you don't know. Saying that, no one comes up to you on the table and says, mm, a non-Muslim, you know, Shafi'i in his Risala said this, but Mu'alik's Mu'atta, he said that. I mean, they're not coming with fiqhi, twisty, uh, very difficult questions. They're kufar, they're just coming with stupidity, you know. It's kind of straightforward. So it's quite easy, alhamdulillah, to answer them. It's not like, you know, so brothers get confused. They kind of imagine people are going to come up to them with uh, Fath al-Bari and, you know, say, oh, this point here, and you're going to be very confused. No, it's straightforward. These people are non-Muslims. They ask stupid questions. You be patient with them, inshallah, and uh, be kind and listen to them, even though what you hear is uh, it's crazy sometimes. And inshallah, with good manners and good adab, you know, you, um, you give them the answer. So that's basically the IPO DAWA table project. It was just an idea, uh, an opportunity to give Muslims somewhere to, to, you know, to go out and give DAWA. And there's been no more important time than the period, of course, that we're in now. The issue really now for Muslims is, is Islam. Every single week we know the newspapers, the television, the radio, they're talking about Islam. These, these call-in shows, I advise you, brothers and sisters, um, John Gaunt show, 94.9 uh, Radio London, they have co issues about Islam. Call them up, especially sisters, especially sisters, call them up and defend Islam. Uh, Nick Ferrari's show, on in the morning, again, call these shows up, listen to them, and if they talk about the deen, call them up and defend Islam. And if you're able to do a dawah table, we're not a hizb, we're not a party, we provide you with the books, the literature, the poster, the chairs, because it's good to sit down when you do your dawah, be comfortable and happy. And if you want any assistance in that way, uh, contact brother Zafar, inshallah, and he will give you all of the support you need. We'll put, put you on to us and we can do it, inshallah. Very important for us to get out there and do the dawah and give people, you know, the true message of Islam. The reason why I bought, by the way, my children is because I don't have a dawah partner like a brother or sister. I have my daughter, my son, my brother-in-law. Those, these are the ones who do my table with me. They have a rota once a month, once a one, you know, once once every Saturday. It's either Mariam or it's Junaid or it's Bilal. These are my dawa helpers. They start the table with me at 12 o'clock, alhamdulillah, and they finish at 5 o'clock on a Saturday. They do five hours once, one Saturday, uh, you know, in a rota, so to speak. So you don't need to have, you know, um, if you, for those brothers who can't find anybody, grab a family member, inshallah. You know, grab somebody, but if you can do it, Contact us, inshallah, and we'll assist you, inshallah. So that's, you know, I apologize, it's uh, brief, inshallah, but do the dawah, do the dawah, read, study, do the dawah, inshallah. We've got to get the message of Islam across to people, we've got to work hard, inshallah. So, you know, may Allah bless you, all of your efforts. May Allah accept your Ramadan fasting, uh, and the Ramadan and efforts of all of the Muslims all over. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdika ashiru la ilaha anta wa astafruqa atubu alayk. Jazakallah khair. Oh, all right, a quick question or two. Anybody? Shall I anything? Okay, 94.9 FM, Radio London. Shala? Mashallah, 97.3. Yeah, who's, who, who's called any of these stations up? Anyone here other than me? Come on, Aki, you called them up, you text? Oh, Mashallah, you text. You called, yeah? Aki? Who did you, uh, which did you get through when you were on there? Um, I just want to say though, in regards to following up, um, I find that a lot of the Muslims, and especially because of the presenter, the way he tells me, hmm. they're very easy, it's very easy for the person to twist, twist and turn. Yeah. yeah. And then they shake the, the, the caller yeah. to the answer, the, the answer that they want. Hmm. So, um, I mean, I've, I've heard so many Muslims bring, bring in and say, oh, you know, yeah, I don't wear hijab, I'm a Muslim and Yeah, yeah, alhamdulillah. So uh, yeah. how do you how do you come and then you have the, the other person yes. brings in and says whoever that Muslim that was talking to you there, yeah. that she's she's totally wrong. Yeah. She doesn't know what she's, what she's talking about. So then you have this online battle yeah. between the Muslims. 
<laughs> yeah, but brother, in the, what I would say is this. First and foremost, you do have that, but the non-Muslims as well. You have them pro and against. You have them, you have Christians call it, you have ignorance. I mean, I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, I phoned in for the, the last European Football Championships. And he said, you know, we should all get behind the St. George's flag and I want to see it on your cars and I want to see you out wearing the t-shirts and so on and so forth. I said, look, I phoned in, I said, I'm British and blah, 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 I'm born and raised, but I'm a Muslim. And basically, for me, this is a Christian symbol. You know, and I can't, you know, I'm a Muslim and I want England to win, no problem. We want them to beat whoever they were playing. We want them to win the European Football Championships. Sometimes it's a way of giving doubt. You don't need to be coming straight out and say, Qal Allah, Qal Rasul. Just by saying a Muslim and we want, yeah, we want them to win the football. But you're giving doubt in that way. But saying this is also a Christian, a religious symbol and blah, blah, blah. And, blah. and this, this, you know, made many people phone up in my defense and said it's right. And some Jews and many Christians phoned in and said it is a Christian symbol and you cannot expect Muslims and so on and so forth to wave it and so on and so forth. So you do get examples of ignorant people, you do get jahil people making these statements, you do, but at the same time you get some brothers and sisters making good points. So what you've got to do is obviously be prepared, know what you're going to say, and just say that and nothing else. You know, I'm going to say this, I'm going to stick to my script. If he tries to play fast and loose and try and twist you up, well, that's how it is. You've got to, I mean, yeah, I'm not saying anyone just phone in ignorantly. Know your stuff, know what you're going to say, inshallah. Or, which is a good example what the brother's done here, is text or email. Because all they'll do is read out your text or your email and there is no answering back. So, that, you, know, you know, they can't argue with you. So 97.3 is Nick Ferrari in the mornings and 94.9 is John Gaunt in the mornings inshallah also Vanessa Feltz in the afternoon they had a, a discussion talking about the rights of fathers and uh, should fathers be respected no matter what the situation so this, so this Christian was on there and she said what if the woman was raped by the, the, meaning the child has to respect the father that's what it was so this, the woman on the show Vanessa Feltz said what if a woman was raped and the child is born, does that child have to respect the rapist? Do you know what the Christian said? Yes! The child must respect his father. She said, but the child was, you know, a product of rape. And you, and you must, and you must. And there's a Jew there, and they were saying the same thing. Hamdallah I phoned up and said about the Islamic perspective of adultery, and the position of a father who was, you know, and the position of a rapist. And I read the Athar of Umar, you know, this, um, when the, the father came to Umar and said, my son has broken the ties of kinship. And if you know, know this, and he's, he's, he's a very serious thing, he's broken the ties of kinship. And uh, Umar radiallahu ordered the boy to be brought forward. And he said, your father has said that you've broken the ties of kinship. And he said, well, now answer. So he said, well, I must speak the truth. And he said, my father married a woman from a tribe known for their lewd behavior. And I don't want to say anything more than that. My father gave me a name which meant black beetle. And the children used to tease me in the streets. My father has never taken me to a masjid or taught me how to pray. And upon this, Umar said, By Allah, to the father, it is you who broke the ties before they were joined. So I explained, the, I read this, this particular um, athar and I also quoted from uh, Surah Al-Isra regarding the position of parents and so on and so forth. But gave clarification, she was, she's a Jew and she was agreeing with me. So alhamdulillah, you know, just, no, just research either text, email or phone. But this is a very, very good way of giving dawah, you know. And leaflets in dentist surgeries, how many times you sit down in a dental surgery and you see Watchtower from Jehovah's Witnesses. How many times, anyone seen it? Jehovah's Witnesses leave, they go in there, they're like that. And then they leave. I came out of the station now, I came out of the station, I was waiting to be picked up. The poster in front of me, Bible studies and blah, I just wanted, where's my scissors, you know? But I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to, I just want to go over there and take this thing away. So, sisters, brothers, sisters, subtle dawa, a few leaflets on a, on a, on a, in a dentist surgery, in a hospital, a few booklets here and there. Brothers who drive minicabs have some booklets in your minicab. Sisters have a little booklet in your handbag. You never know how many times have you found yourself falling into a discussion, Islamic discussion, and oh man, I would love to have given like, somebody a, a, that booklet. Put a few booklets in your bag, take them around with you, you never know, inshallah. brief background of myself is predominantly family upbringing agnostic with Christian overtones. 
agnostic in the sense that God was indirectly referred to, but really seen as being too far or too distant or unknowable, unknowable to you or in your life. And really the Christian overtones were simply coming from school education with uh, scripture lessons or family gatherings at weddings or funerals in churches. This is when I started to work at a school at Greystones. It was a, an intensive English centre for students uh, first coming into the country, refugees. And it was their exposure to Australia and the Australian education system. And I found these Muslim students to be very different from the limited exposure at that point in time that I had to other students teaching them. There was, they were polite, they were well-mannered, eager to learn. They didn't see school as an imposition, they were keen. The older boys, particularly uh, the older Afghani boys, they seemed to take a bit of an interest in me and um, were asking me lots of questions about, you know, what did I believe? You know, was I a Christian, a non-believer, this, that? Always questioning me. And so I just thought, out of curiosity, I thought, okay, I'll, I'll see what this Islam is, just, just for my own knowledge, nothing, nothing more than this. So I borrowed a copy of the Quran from one of the, the brothers. And I was surprised with what I read. I suppose I didn't really have any ideas in my mind because I'd never really investigated Islam before. But the thing that I remember sticking out to me was the names of the prophets. These were something familiar, very familiar to me. And um, what I found out to be later, the core tenet about one God only. This is who you turn to, this is who you ask, this is who provides. This was very rational, very sensible, very accessible for me. And so I thought, well, I don't know, maybe I'd taken a bit of a bait or something like this. I, I wanted to find out more. Still, just, just curious, but my curiosity was growing. So I, I contacted this, I got a number of this Afghani man who was told to be knowledgeable and ask him, his English is good, have a talk with him. So I, I made an appointment with him to talk to him at the, the big masjid at Auburn there and I met him, with, met him there one evening. And I can still remember the feeling when I was waiting outside, just getting ready to go in. I don't know, I wasn't nervous, uh, I wasn't anxious, I don't know, it was, I was just like, feeling a compulsion to, to do this. And he sat with me a long time that, that afternoon and evening, uh, asked, answering my questions, explaining concepts in Islam to me, many, many different things. And um, I'm very grateful to this brother for all this uh, information and assistance he gave me, because I was able to meet with him a number of times after that. And he explained it to me that in order to be a Muslim, it's quite simple. Just to say the Shahada, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And he said to me that this is the beginning. It's the start, it's not the end. There is more, but it's as simple as this. So I decided, I said to him, yes, I'm ready for this. Something, something clicked, it was simple, it was straightforward for me. And I can still remember this afternoon, the afternoon when I met him at his house and we were going off to this um, Saturday evening class that he had at the Blacktown Masjid with some Afghani brothers there and um, you know, he just sat me down and said, you know, you sure this is what you want to do? You're, you understand everything here so that I was un he wanted to make sure that I was under no misapprehensions whatsoever. I said to him, yeah, yeah I'm sure. And a funny thing happened on the way. He was going to pick up another elder of the community. And I had hardly time to walk through the door of this elder's house when I was rained with these sweets and chocolates and he's kissing me and grabbing me and hugging me and I had no idea who this old man was. <laughs> and it sort of scared me initially and I really didn't have the nerve to ask probably until about two or three years later, what was this, you know? What was it that hit me, these lollies and the hugs and the kisses and whatnot? And I got told, no, no, don't worry, this is just something from our foreign culture. They're very, very happy and pleased that you've done something big and great. But at the time, I, I couldn't understand what he was saying. I, it was a big shock. And when we got to the masjid, once again, it was all very simple, very straightforward. Recite the shahada publicly in front of Muslims. This is it, you're a Muslim. I haven't had much opportunity to meet many other reverts, but I think one of the more interesting ones I think I have met was this uh, Vietnamese brother one evening at, at the masjid. He was just sitting there, very quiet, very unassuming. I started to talk with him and he told me that he was previously a professional kickboxer. I thought, oh, okay, this is... I'll just be very, very nice to you and talk very politely. And... <laughs> 
he, he seemed so quiet and I, I wouldn't have ever guessed this from him. And we saw the same thing, you know, how did you come to Islam, how did you come to Islam, this, that. And he was telling me that before when he wasn't a Muslim, he was, um, in his big major professional bout he was in. And he, after the bout he finished and he lost and it was this um, Afghani brother he'd fought, another professional kickboxer. And he was commenting to him, you know, how his skill was and his endurance in the fight and this, that. And the brother said to him simply, it's not me, it's just something from Allah. And this really apparently has just shocked him. Because I think the impression that he had before was most other fighters really said, you know, it's, it's all me, it's all my skill, it's all this. And apparently that's what led him to investigate further. But in conclusion, to any, any of the guests, if we have any, or if you can advise your non-Muslim friends that if they're really interested in Islam, don't judge Islam by the Muslims. Look and investigate Islam. Keep your mind and your heart open. Keep it sincere. Read about Islam from reputable sources, not just from anywhere. And don't delay. If the inclination is there and you feel it, go, because Allah might never give this opportunity to you again. There's no guarantee. And also, when they embrace Islam, be there for them. Or direct them on to people who can give them a, a community that they can link on to and be comfortable with, who they can ask questions to, socialise with, do all these sort of things. So they feel comfortable because they're developing a new Islamic identity and their iman is slowly growing.